Okay, welcome to the second in our series of new videos looking at aspects of fiscal policy. Uh, in the first video, uh, we focused on government spending, and in this video, we'll look at taxation. This was the chart we had last time. It shows the orange line uh, government spending heading northwards of £850 billion, likely to be much, much higher, of course, in 2020 with the effects of the coronavirus. Uh, the blue line is taxation, all of the tax revenues that are coming in from across the different types of taxes, uh, obviously climbing still, but well below government spending. So therefore, the government is running a budget deficit and will need to borrow money to fund that. And the budget deficit or the budget balance is the topic for our third video in this series. So why does a government tax? Well, here are three key reasons. The first is fundamental. Governments need to raise money from taxation to help pay for government-provided public services, such as education, defence, health and social care. The second way that, uh, second reason, if you like, the motivation for taxation is that governments are using it as an intervention to correct for one or more market failures. An obvious example would be something like a sugar tax to try to address obesity. Uh, perhaps a tax on high-fat foods may come in in the future. And also things like environmental taxes, such as the landfill tax, and potentially a carbon tax in the UK in the years ahead. And the third reason governments use tax is to change the final distribution of income and wealth. We call this redistribution, using tax as well as welfare to, in a sense, bring down the levels of uh, income and wealth inequality in a country. If you were designing a tax system from scratch, if you had a blank sheet of paper, how, what would you include in your taxes? What principles might you use to guide your tax architecture? Well, in 1776, Adam Smith, in The Wealth of Nations, uh, put forward the argument that a tax system should, if possible, follow four principles. Fairness, certainty, convenience and efficiency. Fairness, in many ways, is, a, uh, is open to value judgments. Let me pick out two aspects that some people will focus on. One is the benefit-pay principle. This is the idea that if you benefit from public services, the NHS, for example, or state education, or a new road or flood defence in your locality, if you benefit, you should make some contribution towards the cost of that. In other words, you shouldn't be a free rider. Another aspect of fairness or equity is that tax should be based on an ability to pay tax. In most countries, that idea of progressivity, that people with bigger shoulders perhaps should bear more of the burden, is essentially built into the tax system, and we'll cover that in, in a few minutes. A second principle is certainty. You know, you should know what your tax burden more or less is going to be for the next three, six months or a year. That's particularly important for businesses, as well as people like self-employed, Whose, uh, whose incomes vary quite a bit over the course of a year. Tax systems, according to Smith, should be convenient. They should be relatively easy to pay. Uh, and also, there should be relatively low collection costs relative to the money that's coming in. And ideally, a tax system should be fairly efficient, hard to avoid, hard to evade, and with relatively limited or small unintended effects, such as perhaps a loss of efficiency or uh, in one market or industry. Taxes often lead to unintended consequences and can be seen as a form of government failure. The tax base of a country is not widely understood, but essentially the tax base asks two questions. One, what are we taxing? And two, who's paying the tax? So what is tax? Well, traditionally, in the UK, for example, we have taxed income, we've taxed wealth, including, for example, inheritance tax, and we've also taxed spending. But of course, as, as time goes on, we think of new things to tax. Uh, pollution, of course, is uh, climate change is right at the top of the uh, political agenda and the economic agenda. A lot of governments now broadening the base of so-called green taxes, uh, including uh, carbon taxation. And who knows what we might be taxing in the future? We might be taxing data. Uh, we might be taxing financial transactions. Some people think, for example, the government should get together and levy a very, very small transactions tax on every single financial tra transaction in stock markets, currency markets and bond markets, designed to raise revenue, but also designed to reduce speculation. The second part of the tax burden is who is paying the tax. Uh, who faces the biggest burden? Is it households? 
you and I in different families across the country, or is the burden of tax felt most strongly by by businesses? That's an important question for governments to to ask. <clears throat> Moving on to a next definitions, uh, that's the difference between a direct and an indirect tax. Direct versus indirect tax. Traditionally, direct taxes are levied on household income, wealth, and also corporate income in the form of profit. And examples include income tax, inheritance tax, corporation tax, and national insurance contributions. The key point about a direct tax <coughs> is the burden of a tax cannot be passed on. I can't pass on my tax bill to somebody else much as I would like to. On the other hand, indirect taxes, well, these are taxes on spending. Typically, we pay them when we buy a good or service which is subject to a tax. We might be filling up our, our car at the petrol station. We're paying some excise duty there. We might be buying some alcohol or some cigarettes. We pay some duty uh, at the shops. Now, well, the thing about an indirect tax, of course, is that producers, if we're taxing the supplier, they might be able to pass on an indirect tax, depending on the coefficient of price elasticity of demand and also supply. Typically, when a product has a low price elasticity of demand, the supplier is able to pass on most of, perhaps all of, a tax to the consumer. Let's uh, do a little game here. Can you get through the next five examples without making an error? I'll leave a few seconds uh, between each. I'm going to give you five taxes and you have to decide, think out loud if you want to, whether this is a direct or an indirect tax. So can you get a streak of five correct answers? First tax, value added tax, VAT. Direct or indirect? Well, the answer is, it's indirect. Second tax, the taxation on savings in bank accounts. What do you think, direct or indirect? Well, the answer is it is a direct tax. Because interest on savings is a form of income to people with money in the bank accounts. Can you get three out of three? Next one, corporation tax, tax on company profits, direct or indirect? Have a go. And the answer is direct. Two more. Can you get that streak of five? Car insurance tax, a tax when you take out a car insurance policy, direct or indirect? And the answer is indirect. And the last one, tobacco duty. Tobacco duty, the duty on cigars and cigarettes. Direct or indirect? What do you think? The answer is indirect. These are the main taxes in the UK. The bulk, and you see right down at the bottom of the slide here, the bulk of taxes come from just, essentially, just five or six key taxes. Business rates, uh, council tax, corporation tax, and then the big three, value added tax, national insurance, and income tax. Together, each of those adds up to an absolutely enormous amount of tax revenue for the government. The bulk of tax in the UK comes from those three big taxes. Let's finish this video with a look at another distinction in the tax system. This is by way of introduction. And I thought it'd be just good just to bring in another distinction between three types of tax. Progressive, proportional, regressive. Progressive, proportional, regressive. Now, with a progressive tax, what happens is that as people's, people earn more income, the marginal rate of tax goes up. That's the tax you pay on the next pound or dollar of income. So the marginal rate of tax goes up as people uh, have get a better paid job, for example, or get a pay rise. It could be the case that the rate of tax they pay on each extra pound goes up. And if the marginal tax is rising, this causes an increase in the average rate of tax, tax as a percentage of income. Good example are direct taxes. So if you take income tax, council tax, and employees national insurance, that's the national insurance paid by the employee, not the employer. Have a look at this chart. Can you see we're going from left to right. The bottom quintile is the poorest 20% of households through to the top quintile, which is the richest. Uh, disposable income equivalized means adjusting for family size. And you can see that the bottom quintile pay around 12% of their disposable income in direct tax, whereas the top quintile, if you look those taxes together, the three different shades of green, they're paying upwards of 23% of their gross household disposable income in direct taxes.
With a proportional tax, the marginal tax rate is essentially flat, it's constant, meaning that the average rate of tax, again, pretty much is the same. And some countries have moved towards a so-called flat tax system. Russia, my students found some examples, the Seychelles, Mongolia, Poland. Might be worth exploring this with your Google search. The countries that are currently using some kind of flat tax system, very simple system where everybody pays the same marginal rate. And then finally, we come to regressive taxes. Now, the key definition of a regressive tax is that the rate of tax paid, the percentage tax paid, falls as income goes up. In other words, the average rate of tax as a percentage is lower for people on higher incomes. But actually, the burden of the tax may fall more heavily on lower income families. This chart explains it, I think, and shows it quite nicely. This is indirect taxes, VAT, alcohol duty, tobacco tax, uh, fuel duty and vehicle excise duty, and other indirect taxes. And can you see that the bottom quintile of individuals in the UK, they pay 26% of their disposable income in indirect taxes, whereas we head down towards the right, the richest, the better off 20%, they only pay around 14 or 15 percent of their disposable income in indirect taxes. Now, of course, they're paying more in direct tax, so we're kind of flipping it, aren't we? But can you see the indirect taxes overall, on balance, have a have a, a regressive effect? They they fall more heavily on the bottom quintile, and you may want to think about some of the reasons why that's the case. Last slide to finish with is this slide, which shows that the top income, uh, the top 50% of households by income, uh, they pay nearly four-fifths of all the tax revenues uh, going into the government. So you're going from left to right here, we're going from the top 10% down to the ninth, tenth deciles, and it's quite very steep at the start. So the top 20%, for example, are paying a lot of, uh, a lot of tax and income tax and national insurance. Uh, in other words, half the taxpayers pay four-fifths of the tax revenue, and that in a sense raises the question about how much extra tax can you squeeze from people on high incomes. Um, there's a, it's a, a big debate about how much tax is optimal for those people. But this has just been in, an introduction to tax. We will come back to tax in a future video. The next video in the series is going to look at the economics of the budget deficit. Okay, thank you very much indeed.